Hello, everyone. Welcome to this month's webinar of the International ESNFL Society. Next slide, please. Today's session is going to be dedicated to upper airway disease, and we're going to be hearing a lot about eosinophils and the pathogenesis of chronic rhinocytositis, polyposis, and uh, we'll be having uh, both some basic biology and some more clinically oriented uh, data that will be presented today. Next slide, please. Before actually presenting today's moderator, I would just like to uh, give you a few basic pieces of information about our society for those of you who are not aware of our existence and or our activities. Uh, our mission statement is shown on this slide. And if you have uh, the time and if you wish to know more about us, uh, our, uh, uh, our website is shown in the lower left-hand corner of this slide. Next slide. A few uh, rules for today's uh, and tips for today's webinar are shown here. Um, we will have a moderator who will be addressing the questions uh, to the speakers on your behalf today. So that means that throughout the presentations, you can use the question and answer button and enter your questions anytime you want. And these questions will be asked at the end of each presentation. You're all muted uh, and the chat feature is disabled. So you will really only be able to use that question and answer box. If you have technical difficulties as usual, the best solution is often trying to log off and log back on again. And uh, also please be aware that this webinar is being recorded and uh, will be posted on our website that was just shown on the previous slide uh, within a few days. So that if you wish to re-view uh, uh, the, the slides or if you want to share them with someone, uh, they will be accessible very rapidly. Next slide. So it's really with great pressure that I introduce today's moderator, uh, Professor Bruce Bachner, who was uh, the past president of our society, uh, working at Northwestern University Fine Bird School of Medicine in the Division of Allergy and Immunology. He will be presenting today's speakers and moderating today's session. Thank you very much, Bruce. Thanks, Florence. Good day to everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to host and moderate today's session. Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, a wonderful array of outstanding physician scientists who will be talking, um, as Florence mentioned, about basic and clinical and translational aspects of uh, chronic upper airway disease involving the sinuses. Next slide. So without further ado, we'll get right to it. First presenter is my colleague, Dr. Whitney Stevens, who's sitting over there, I think, uh, probably across the hall. Title of her presentation is Contributions of Eosinophils in CRS Pathogenesis and Clinical Presentation. Whitney, take it away. That looks good. Sorry, you're still muted. All right, here we go. So for those of you who don't think about chronic rhinosinusitis on a daily basis, it's a disease characterized by chronic inflammation of the paranasal sinuses. Clinically, patients need to have for at least 12 weeks symptoms, including a runny nose, post-nasal drip, nasal congestion, facial pressure, pain, and reduced or even absent sense of smell. Additionally, you need to have objective evidence of sinonasal inflammation, and this can be observed on sinus CT scan here. You can see opacification of the sinuses. And additionally, um, you can also visualize this by nasal endoscopy. There's two major phenotypes of chronic rhinosinusitis. One is chronic rhinosinusitis without nasal polyps called CRS SNP. And the other group is CRS with nasal polyps or CRS WNP. Now, the majority of patients who have CRS do not have polyps. They have CRS SNP. And about 30% of CRS SNP patients have comorbid asthma. Now, mechanistically, less is known about the disease pathogenesis driving CRS SNP, um, but that is currently changing. And as of right now, there's fewer clinically available treatment options for these patients. In contrast, 
uh, about 18 to 20 percent of patients with CR um, have CRS with nasal polyps. And on average, CRS with nasal polyps is just more severe sinonasal disease than CRS S&P. About 30% of patients who um, have polyps that undergo surgery to have their polyps removed will have recurrence of their polyps. And about 50 to 60% of patients with nasal polyps have comorbid asthma. And patients with both polyps and comorbid asthma have more severe upper and lower airway disease than patients with just one. Additionally, and near and dear to my heart, are the 10 to 16% of patients with nasal polyps who have something called aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, which is the tri, also known as NSAID exacerbated respiratory disease or Samter's triad. And these patients have CRS with nasal polyps, asthma, and they also have an intolerance to COX-1 inhibitors, such as aspirin, um, Aleve, uh, ibuprofen, naproxen, uh, medications like that. Patients with AERD tend to have the most severe form of sinonasal disease among the, along the spectrum. Now, fortunately, there's been lots of um, more mechanistic studies available trying to understand the pathogenesis with nasal polyps. And what you'll hear about later today is there's also been more recent advancements in treatment options for this subset of patients. Now, why would a group of eosinophil experts be interested in something growing in one's nose? Well, it turns out that most nasal polyps have eosinophils um, and have high levels of eosinophils and this is compared to control healthy sinonasal tissue. But unlike EOE, for example, there isn't really an established uh, or well con uh, consensus on what cutoff of eosinophils in nasal polyp tissue will be defined as eosinophilic. But again, there's lots of eosinophils in most nasal polyps, and I stress most. Additionally, um, levels of eosinophil granule proteins like charcolite and crystal, uh, CLC or eosinophil cationic protein are also elevated in nasal polyps compared to control um, healthy sinonasal tissue. And you can see that even among patients with CRS with nasal polyps, there is heterogeneity in the CLC expression with some patients represented as individual dots having higher levels of CLC or ECP compared to other patients who may have lower levels. Uh, our group has used a cutoff of um, 90 or 95% uh, of CLC levels compared to this normal healthy control. And if we say um, how many patients have CLC or ECP greater than the 90th percent cutoff in control ethmoid tissue, you can see that 87% of patients with nasal polyps fit in that criteria. And so we say that about 87% of patients with CRS with WMP in Chicago have this type 2 inflammatory endotype. There are sub smaller subsets of patients that have a predominant type 1 or type 3, but again, the majority of patients in Chicago have this type 2 inflammatory endotype. Interestingly, and I won't dwell on this um, too much, but also about 55% of patients in Chicago who don't have nasal polyps also have this type 2 inflammatory endotype. A different study um, from Europe used IL-5 as a criteria to help um, classify or uh, determine endotypes of CRS, and there's uh, groups of patients who have uh, high IL-5 levels versus low IL-5 levels. And you can see that more patients with polyps will fit in that high IL-5 level as well as with asthmatics. So again, there's uh, type 2 inflammatory endotype um, is seen um, in patients with nasal polyps. This is a busy slide, um, but I want to draw your attention to just the CRS WMP column here on the far right. And you can see that um, across the board, patients with nasal polyps have this high ex or upregulation of type 2 inflammatory um, or type 2 associated genes, including not only CLC, but IL-5 and IL-13. Again, suggesting that um, these patients, at least here in Chicago, with nasal polyps have this type 2 inflammatory endotype. And I keep stressing that most nasal polyps have a uh, type 2 inflammatory endotype, and that's clearly what you see in Western societies like in the U.S. and Europe. But interestingly, in China, you don't see as strong of a type 2 inflammatory endotype. 
um, it's much more of a mix. Um, it's not as much eosinophilic. However, interestingly, over the past 10 years, there's been data showing that that's actually evolving and there is more, an increase in the type 2 inflammatory endotype in, uh, in Asian countries. And the mechanisms that are causing the switch or change in endotype are not fully understood, but are being investigated. So I'm going to focus the rest of my talk on this type 2 inflammatory endotype. And really the million dollar question is what on earth are eosinophils doing? And I wish I could tell you I had the answer, um, but there's been a lot of studies looking and trying to figure out how eosinophils could be playing a role in disease. And one way you could think about it is eosinophils are somehow influencing the clinical findings, they're associated with clinical findings, they're, it could be an, a biomarker for clinical disease. And you can um, think about clinical disease in two ways. One is objectively, how does the patient's CT scan look? Do they have polyps? Um, and then subjectively, what's the patient reporting? How are they feeling? So interestingly, um, this was a study done from a, a large study in Japan and found that if you have greater than 70 eosinophils per high powered field in your cyanonasal tissue, you are at much increased risk. It's this light gray line much um, increased risk of having a recurrence of your uh, sinonasal disease, a serious recurrence following surgery. So eosinophils may be a biomarker of disease recurrence. Interestingly, peripheral blood eosinophils also can be an indicator of having a um, more likely chance of having recurrence of CRS after your surgery with greater than 10% peripheral blood eosinophil level associated um, with the highest um, uh, ratio or chance of having uh, recurrence of your sinonasal disease. This is a busy slide that's recent work from our group. That is, and I just want to point out that ECP and IL-5 are one of a few factors that also can predict um, whether or not you would have polyp recurrence. And so if you have higher levels of ECP and IL-5 in your polyp tissue at the time of surgery, you are more likely to have recurrence or regrowth of that polyp um, in the in the subsequent years. Now, one of the biggest complaints of patients who have nasal polyps is they can't smell. They can't smell, they can't taste their food. They're pretty miserable. And again, this is something that's more seen with CRS WMP. Again, this lack of or decrease in smell. What's interesting is that ES, there may be a correlation between eosinophils and your lack of smell. So on the graph on the left, um, this is CLC expression, looking at IT, which is the inferior turbinate, which is the kind of a control um, uh, sign, part of the sinonasal tissue, and then also in the superior turbinate, which is near the olfactory cleft. And as you can see in patients with WNP, or nasal polyps, you can see that there's an increased level of CLC present in the superior turbinate near the olfactory cleft compared to the inferior turbinate and then compared to healthy sinonasal tissue. And on the right, you can see a graph and on the x-axis, it's um, a gene expression of CLC going to the right is there's increase in eosinophils to the left um, is decrease in eosinophils. And on the y-axis is sense of smell. So the worse your smell is, the lower you are on the y-axis. And you can see there's actually a correlation between CLC expression. So the higher your CLC expression, the worse the patient reported their sense of smell, suggesting that eosinophils may be contributing to sense of smell or at least may serve as a biomarker for patients having worse, um, worse smell. Looking at a more recent um, study that we did, again, defining patients who with this type 2 inflammatory endotype as having high levels of CLC and ECP in the pink, you can see that those patients have, um, uh, are more likely to report smell loss than patients with a type 1 or type 3 inflammatory endotype. When looking at, and this on the left was all patients with CRS in our study, and when you look on the right, we split it into patients without polyps, and again, this presence of a type 2 or increased levels of CLC and ECP was more associated with patients reporting smell loss, and again, patients who had the presence of um, this type 2 endotype in WMP, there was a um, trend to having, again, a reduction in smell loss more so than patients who do not have a type 2. So there suggests that eosinophils may be um, playing a role not only in predicting disease recurrence, or, but they also either may be directly contributing to smell loss, but at least could be serving as a potential biomarker for um, some of the clinical symptoms. <laughs> 
And there's a lot of work ongoing to try to link eosinophils with other clinical symptoms. Um, and there's work that's um, coming out uh, trying to link and see if the eosinophil can serve as a biomarker for some of these other symptoms um, and further understanding how it could be related to um, uh, objective clinical findings that we see. The other thing that eosinophils could be doing is they actually could be contributing directly to pathogenesis and how, and you know, the question is how could they be doing this? Uh, one such um, study looking from Japan was looking at CD69 on eosinophils in the polyps and in matched blood of patients with CRS. And you can see that CD69 gene expression here in figure A is highly upregulated on eosinophils and nasal polyps compared to matched peripheral blood. And then you can see in a select patient that CD69 expression by flow cytometry, the MFI um, is higher on eosinophils compared to peripheral blood. And again, you can see that eosinophils in the polyp have higher CD69 expression, again, than in matched blood, suggesting that these eosinophils are coming into the polyp and they're more activated. So what could these eosinophils be doing? Well, one of the things um, that polyps are known for is fibrin deposition. And so fibrin, think of fibrin as the scaffold that holds the polyp up together. And so we know that nasal polyps have a lot of fibrin. And, I'm, and this could be a whole hour talk, which I'm going to kind of briefly go through. But to get to fibrin, you need to have the coagulation cascade turned on. And tissue factor is a prominent factor that can help turn on the coagulation cascade that can lead to fibrin deposition. And there's been some nice studies looking at tissue factor being expressed in eosinophils. You can see here that there's nice co-localization between major basic protein in green and the tissue factor in red here, suggesting that eosinophils can be a source of tissue factor. And then L-plastin was recently found, um, L-plastin translocates the tissue factor to the surface of the eosinophil. And so L-plastin was found to be um, significantly elevated in AERD polyps, again, the most severe form of this disease. Um, and there was a nice correlation between L-plastin level uh, positive cells and eosinophils. And on the right, oops, and on the right, you can see that if you have L plast, um, if eosinophils are cultured with GMCSF, you can see that there and there's L plastin present. There's nice um, uh, tissue factor um, expression on the cell surface. Um, however, if you use siRNA to essentially knock out L plastin, you don't see this nice upregulation of tissue factor on the surface. So, one possible way eosinophils could be contributing to disease pathogenesis is used in the coagulation cascade with tissue factor. Um, and that again leads to um, thrombin, which leads to fibrin formation. So eosinophils may be related or may be helping in fibrin formation. And a lot more, of course, is needed to be done to study this process and study fibrin in nasal polyps. Another um, uh, interesting thing that eosinophils may be doing is actually talking with neutrophils. So not only are eosinophils or CLC elevated in nasal polyps, you can see that the neutrophils are also elevated in nasal polyps, and there's a nice correlation between the level of CLC or the number of CLC positive cells and the number of neutrophils in nasal polyp patients. And if you were to incubate CLC with epithelium, you can cause an increase in the production of pro-inflammatory markers, such as IL-1 beta, IL-6, and IL-8. And um, if uh, epithelial cells are cultured with uh, CLC and then neutrophils are added in a Boyden chamber, you can see that there's an increase in neutrophil chemotaxis um, in the presence of CLC, suggesting that CLC may be um, contributing to, pro to the inflammatory environment. And interestingly, clinical studies have found that if you have both an eosinophilic and a neutrophilic um, are eosinophils and neutrophils in your nasal polyps, you have more severe sinonasal disease. Again, suggesting another mechanism by which eosinophils could be working with neutrophils to cause enhanced disease severity. But what we really need is an eosinophil knockout human to really understand what eosinophils could be doing in terms of um, CRS pathogenesis. And while we don't have that, we do have several agents that have been um, test approved for the treatment of nasal polyps, such as mepolizumab. And you're going to hear a lot about um, more of these biologics um, in the next two talks. 
Um, but I wanted to draw your attention to two interesting studies that weren't exactly what I thought might happen. The first study is dexpramipexol, and this was given to a small cohort of patients with nasal polyps. And dexpramipexol, we don't know the mechanism by which it works, but we do know that dexpramipexol will cause a nice reduction in peripheral eosinophils, and at six months, a nice reduction in the amount of eosinophils detected in nasal polyps. But interestingly, even though dexpramipexol did get rid of eosinophils, their polyps were still there suggesting that, well, maybe eosinophils aren't the end-all be-all in driving um, CRS pathogenesis. Maybe there's other factors that could be important. And interestingly, in this study, um, uh, polyp mast cells actually increased in, the major in some of these patients um, following treatment with dexpramipexol, suggesting again, maybe another cell is playing a role. I don't want to say the eosinophil is not playing a role at all, but again, in this study, you got rid of eosinophils, but your nasal polyps were still there. And this is a case report, so an N of one, so take it for what it's worth, but this is a patient who had AERD, horrible disease, was started on reslizumab, which again um, uh, targets IL-5, and um, you can see here that uh, this patient's disease, this is uh, her peripheral blood eosinophil count on the y-axis. And you can see for several years, her eosinophil count would just go up and down, but this is because um, the, the prednisone uh, given because her symptoms were so severe. So whenever she got prednisone, her eosinophil count did drop, but then it would go back up to higher levels. And then once she was started on reslizumab, there was a complete abrogation of her eosinophil. So there, they were gone. However, her sinus disease persisted despite um, a reduction in peripheral blood eosinophil levels. Um, and it was her sinus disease was so significant that she actually underwent a repeat sinus surgery um, while on the drug. And interestingly, we had tissue banged from a prior sinus surgery when she was not on the drug. So this is our N of one comparing the effects of reslizumab in the in sinonasal tissue in the same patient, um, again, pre-drug and post-drug. And you can see that quite um, nicely that the number of h &E positive um, or staining cells is markedly reduced on the right with the treatment, whereas on the left, you can see lots of eosinophils. When looking at, um, we were able to take um, a polyp tissue and look at CLC by RT-PCR and also ECP. And you can see that rosalizumab caused a nice reduction in CLC, much less than what you typically see in patients with um, nasal polyps. And additionally, ECP again was markedly reduced at levels again, much lower than what you would typically see. Interestingly, this patient again still had bad disease um, and her, and her uh, mast cell numbers went from high to even higher off treatment, suggesting maybe there's a role for mast cells and, and, and why this, there was treatment failure. And again, we also looked at tryptase positive cells by IHC, and again, there was an increase um, after treatment. So based on this, um, you know, the question again is, are eosinophils necessary and or sufficient for um, causing or contributing to disease? We're, the, the verdict's still out. We do think that they are biomarkers. I do think they may be contributing something. But, um, and you're gonna hear more about targeting IL-5 um, and biologics from the next two speakers. And then maybe there's other targets of these drugs that may be contributing to CRS pathogenesis. And with that, I'd like to end with one slide, um, looking at one of the cells that are near and dear to my heart, um, which besides the eosinophil is the basophil. And interestingly, what we found is that basophils are elevated in AERD nasal polyps as well as in uh, regular nasal polyps compared to control tissue, and that these basophils are activated by having um, CD63 expression. Now, we also looked at a granule protein for basophils called 2D7, and we used this um, by using flow cytometry. And if the basophil is degranulated, it's going to lose its 2D7. And so you can see here that um, basophils and nasal polyps, um, and ARD nasal polyps, have less 2D7, significantly more so than in regular polyps. And again, polyps have, uh, basophils have less 2D7 than what you would see in control sinonasal tissue, suggesting that, again, these basophils, like the eosinophil, are coming into the polyp, they're becoming activated, and they're degranulating. And interestingly, the level of degranulation correlates with sinonasal disease severity. 
So in this last figure I'll show you, the lemma chi score is a measure of sinonasal disease severity. The higher the number, the worse your disease. And you can see that patients with have, that have the most severe sinonasal disease tend to have the least amount of 2D7, suggesting that these basophils have degranulated and that may be contributing to disease. So more food for thought and more questions that we need to answer in terms of you know, other cells that might be important in the pathogenesis of nasal polyps. So in summary, um, in Western societies, nasal polyps are characterized by this type two inflammation with increased numbers of eosinophils and levels of eosinophil granule proteins. Eosinophils have been shown to be a biomarker for more severe clinical disease, whether that be smell loss, maybe increased rates of polyp regrowth, need for re recurrent surgeries. And eosinophils may contribute to the pathogenesis of CRS, but there's the verdict is still out on how, on, on how they may actually be contributing. And we definitely need more studies to determine the role these eosinophils and of course other inflammatory cells might be playing, not just in CRS with nasal polyps, but also we need to know more about this CRS without nasal polyps, because again, 55% of those patients also have type two inflammation. So with that, I'd like to thank you all and I'll turn it over back over to our moderator. Thank you, Whitney, that was great and right on time. And I think a perfect overview for uh, today's presentations. While I wait for any questions uh, and remind again, the audience to put their questions in the Q and A, in the Q and A box, um, I'll provide you with a little piece of relevant trivia for today. Um, some of you may know that when I was a medical student, I was fortunate to spend some time in the clinic and in the laboratory with Max Samter of Samter's Triads. And the piece of trivia today is that he had a poodle named Eo. Very appropriate <laughs> given his interests in today's topic. Um, Whitney, maybe I'll start and, and ask you a, a hypothetical question. You laid out this really nice dartboard of cells that can contribute to CRS. And we have darts to throw at eosinophils mm -hmm. and they may or may not. Yes, the perfect dartboard. So hypothetically, if I gave you two darts, one of which will hit the eosinophil, if you had perfect aim, what would you want your second dart to hit what cell? That's a great question. And I think there's a lot of debate on what it could be. I personally would like to hit the basophil, but I don't think that would be the end all be all either. Um, you know, I do think that the mast cell may be playing a role, especially in A or D. Um, I think the mast cell is an important cell that might be triggered as well. I think if you ask Katie Buckite, she would throw that dart at the B cell. Um, if you want to join in, you can, Katie. Um, but I think that for me, the eosinophil, and I, I'd like to say basophil, but I'd probably have to go with the mast cell at this point. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in and say that I think from a mechanistic standpoint, I'd be very um, interested in hitting the dart at the um, B cell. But I think it would be potentially very efficacious to hit it at the, actually the dysregulated epithelium as well. Um, so, you know, lots of different players involved for sure. In fact, Florence asked, any plans for drug to use drugs that target eosinophils, basophils, and mast cells all at once? So I think uh, Philippe will be able to answer that more with his talk in biologics. Um, we, I don't think we've got the magic dart that'll attack all of those at once, um, but we definitely have one that goes after IL-4 and IL-13, which I think is a bit broader than going after just IL-5 or the IL-5 receptor. Um, but I won't still... Uh, Philippe's uh, thunder here. I will hold that one for Philippe to, to speak next and maybe I'll come back to that. Um, Nivis Zimmerman asks, uh, as a pathologist, should she be reporting the density of eosinophils in her path reports on CRS samples that come into the lab? So I think there's been a lot, of, the great question, and I think there's been an evolution in how the, these is, how the pathology has been reported. There's, a, there's been um, new uh, different grades, is, is, there B, is there plasma cells, is there eosinophils, how many eosinophils, because it used to be, it'd just be like, oh, it, there's some eosinophils there, but kind of quantifying the eosinophils would be helpful, but again, we don't have that criteria that EUE has, where you don't, you know, we don't have a cutoff of 
eosinophilic versus non-eosinophilic. Some say 70, 55, you know, it, it still ranges. But I think it is important to um, report on inflammatory cells, especially, how, you know, density of eosinophils would be very helpful. We also have another question about uh, potential interactions between eosinophils and nerves, especially as it relates to loss of sense of smell. Uh, can you comment on what's known about eosinophils and nerves? And in particular, they asked about M2 muscarinic receptors. Which That's a great question that I'm not sure I can actually answer in terms of the relationship with nerves. I do think that there, there should be, a, I don't know if we've fully looked at it. Um, I'm not as up on the olfaction part um, in terms of chemoreceptors and, and that in um, nasal polyp disease. Um, but I do think there, there may be a link between them. Um, but again, I'm not, I don't know. Um, Judah points out a couple things, but I'll, I'll focus on one comment. And that is that uh, he wants to remind us that dexpramapexol uh, not only inhibits eosinophil hematopoiesis, but probably also inhibits basophil hematopoiesis. I think there may be some data that it reduces basophil no. numbers, but uh, I don't know how well documented that is in the clinical trials. And it may tell us a little bit about how and where dexpramapexol works in the hematopoietic um, cascade, but that would be worth taking a look at because if it got rid of eosinophils and and basophils and they didn't get better. Then yeah. I might want to move my dart. Yes, exactly. All right, one last question from um, Prem Nair. Um, he would like to know, um, since some patients with POPs seem to get better when eosinophils are depleted and some don't and mast cells seem to go up, as you pointed out, is it possible that there's a rebound of some part of the Th2 pathway when another one is blocked by a say by a biologic. Fantastic question. And I don't, you know, the big clinical trials didn't really, didn't look at mast cells. So we've only got the mast cells going up in my one patient and then the dexprim and pexel studies. Um, but it is interesting, you know, is it that the patients that are failing have a rebound somewhere in another type two? I think that is a fantastic question. And I think maybe that could, you know, based on what we're seeing in, in our few in, that is something that could be, should be considered. Um, again, it's a really interesting question why some patients do great on, on these biologics. And then again, there's some patients that just fail them. Um, but I think that's a very great observation and I, I would put some stake into that. Great. Thank you. I think we are out of time. Thank you. There may be an extra question or two left in the Q and A. So if you get a chance, Whitney, feel free to answer those, um, offline as we great. continue with the next speaker. So thanks for all the questions and we'll move on to the next presentation that will be given by Philippe Cavert, which I hopefully pronounced correctly. And um, the title of his presentation is Biologicals and the Treatment of Eosinophil Driven Upper Airway Disease. This is an area that Philippe has been an international leader in and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Okay, hello. Thank you for this nice introduction. I really enjoyed already the first talk, which was a perfect start for mine. And I hope you can see my slides now. Yes. So I'm Philippe Gevaert. I'm from Ghent, Belgium. These are my disclosures. And indeed, I work in Ghent since 24 years. And I had the luck to work with a lot of fantastic people like Klaus Bachert, who is a highly cited researcher and ENT surgeon but also with lung physicians like Guy Brusselle, Guy Joos and Bart Lambrecht that are all very uh, important researchers in the field. And I have outpatient clinic every Tuesday afternoon with a lung physician. And we have a lot of discussions on uh, how to treat asthma, nasal polyp patients. And of course, when they have both, uh, how to do that now with the biologicals. Um, we do see a little bit different patients. Uh, we see mostly severe chronic sinusitis patients. They see mostly severe asthma patients, and it's not always the same. I will come later back on that. But I started 24 years back my PhD on, on, on nasal polyps and, and on eosinophils and nasal polyps, and then actually on the AL5 receptor regulation on, on, on the eosinophil. And, and this is the, the cover of my PhD uh, thesis where you nicely see the eosinophils, the red dots there in the nasal polyps that come through the, um, to the mucosa. And, and 
And back then, and, and it took now, and today is actually a great day. First of June, we will have the first anti isnophil drug reimbursed for the indication of nasal polyps in Belgium. But how could that take 24 years? Why did it take so long? And there is a reason why I will explain you why. So the isnophil is an important cell for everyone who is, of course, in the isnophil society, but not everyone believed that uh, back then. And, 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 and this is the history of it. But I left the history very personally. I started my PhD 24 years ago. We were working on an NTL5 drug. And, and then there came this paper from Maggie Lackey showing actually that, 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 that an injection of, of uh, NTL5 didn't really do what it was promised to do. And, and, and later on, there came another paper from Gant from Johan Kipps uh, showing also that in, in asthma, there was no change in the FEV1 in 32 patients with an, an humanized NTL5 antibody. So when I was doing my PG in the middle of it, actually this bomb fell on the field and, and it killed a lot. And actually it killed a lot of isnophil research. And I hear I cite actually, Bruce, I cite you, uh, you, you, you wrote in this article that 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 we the jury is still not out and 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 what is the role of isnophils and isnophil was actually all labs certainly pharmaceutical labs were closed down because of this disappointing first results now 20 years later we know a lot more and we know that it might be a promising target but the jury is still uh, out so I think this is a very interesting story over time. I might uh, remind you that I did the first study back in 2001 with an NTL5 in nasal polyps. Um, it was just before the other papers came out that we already started doing the research. It was the first one injection of reslizumab in nasal polyp patients. We did that. And, and we were lucky to look to nasal polyp score, which decreased in a few patients. And we also saw in nasal secretions, we were looking in nasal secretions as well, that the ECP, isnophilic and cationic program, was going down. And R5 was also going down with one injection. Back then, we believed that one injection only could really cure the disease, which is, of course, something we know is not true today. And luckily, later on, uh, several papers came showing that there is a role for uh, anti life trial treatments. Here you see a paper in hyperisnophilic syndrome, later on also in isnophilic asthma, showing that indeed you need more injections and it's done, it can lead to less exacerbations. I will not dive too much in those early studies, but there was some kind of a very slow revival of the belief in the isnophils by the end of uh, 2010. And also benralizumab was an anti-L5 receptor antagonist. So the others were anti-L5, this an anti-L5 receptor antagonist showed some effects here in severe asthma. So now today, this is a, a review paper recently published in New England Journal of Medicine by Guy Brussello of Ghent highlighting all the treatments, benralizumab, duplumab, mepolizumab, omalizumab, reslizumab, and tezepilizumab as uh, targets in uh, severe asthma. And they also made their algorithm for treatment. And as you can see here, it's very important that still blood isnophils today are the major a way to discriminate which treatment you will take. And so blood isnophils are low, then we more go for an anti-IgE or anti-TSLP. Blood isnophils are increased, then you go more for an NL5 or an anti-L5 receptor antagonist. And although we work so closely together every week, I was a little bit disappointed when I saw the paper coming out that there was little mentioned about nasal polyps because I do believe that also for asthma treatment, one need to look whether there are nasal polyps or not. And I think that this algorithm should include also whether you have nasal polyps or not uh, to choose which medication you should give. Just to highlight for the non-clinicians, where do we find nasal polyps in the asthma patient? Well, it's in this group, right? you have type two, non-type two asthma, but in this group, late onset isnophilic asthma, there is where exactly in those asthmatic patients, you find nasal polyps. 
Now, what about biologicals in chronic sinusitis with these polyps? And, and, and this is a figure you recognize. There is, we are very happy today that several pharmaceutical companies are interested in these polyps as a target because that was not the case 20 years ago. And they, they are willing to do the large trials that we need uh, to have a treatment reimbursed. This is one of the first trials we published in 2012 with mepolizumab. Actually, it was a smaller trial where we give two injections, and these two injections lead to a decrease of nasal polyp score, and we had a success in around 50% of the patients. And what is interesting, I think this is very interesting in mepolizumab in general, and, and soon data will come out on the larger study, is when you have a responder that quite often this response is quite good. And is also long lasting. And this, this is, uh, to my opinion, a little bit different in mepolizumab compared to the other ones, is when you, you have a good responder and you have a good response and you stop the treatment that you might have a longer effect. Uh, and that's what we also have seen here or described in this first uh, very preliminary paper. This is the large trial that was recently published and you see the effect of mepolizumab and anti-L5 on the nasal polyp score. The nasal polyp score is the major scoring system. We just look in the nose with the endoscope and we score on a score of zero to four and the nasal polyps quite often it's done by blinded ENT surgeons who get the videos sent to them and then they score this. And you can see here that the nasal polyps really are shrinking away but this is a little bit slow compared to some other biologicals. So you see that the polyps are shrinking, but this is interesting. At the end of the 52 weeks of treatment, we still didn't reach the plateau phase. So it means that probably treating two years or three years might even get better results. And we might once get also better response or even disease modification that we don't know. It also has a good effect on the nasal obstructions, on symptoms, on the SNOT22. For those who do not know what the SNOT22 is, it's a combined symptom and quality of life score. And you see that indeed the SNOT22 is really improved after one year of treatment with an anti-AL5 drug. Now, I know data are coming out on the long-term follow-up in this trial, and I think they are really interesting. I cannot disclose them yet. You will have to invite me another time to show these data. I want to show now other data. The data I showed now were on anti-AL5. Benralizumab, on the other hand, is an anti-AL5 receptor antagonist. And we were very much hoping that this would be the same result as with an anti-L5. But as you can see here, this uh, paper that was just published, you see that the nasal polyp score is indeed going down over one year. But if you look for the magnitude, it's not that fantastic. It's a little bit of a disappointment. Also, the nasal blockage score was different. But we were a little bit disappointed in this, um, in this effect. And, and, and this is a little bit strange because you think L5, L5 receptor as a target well, it should be the same kind of results. And, and I will come later on that. What well, is very interesting is that they looked into responders in this trial with benralizumab, and you see that those patients with comorbid asthma had a better response, which was actually quite good. Those without asthma actually had no response. And interestingly, if we look for eosinophils, blood eosinophils, and we look those with high blood isnophils, they seem to be very good responders. So probably benralizumab or an anti-L5 receptor antagonist only works in asthmatic patients with nasal polyps, on the nasal polyps, and where you have high isnophils in the blood. So this is very interesting that this is more selected than in the other treatments. What about another drug? And, and, and um, uh, Whitney already pointed at it as an anti-L3 and anti-L4 receptor antagonist, the dupilumab. And we, we have this actually surprising result, to my opinion, 2015, 14, 15, the studies were done. And this is the first trial with dupilumab showing an oppressive effect on the nasal polyp score. Later on, there was done this very famous sinus 24 and sinus 52 uh, study with dupilumab, and you see that indeed if you treat for 24 weeks, then you have a very nice effect, and minus two in the nasal polyp score is great, and if then you stop the treatment, that actually the polyps recur uh, over time. 
What is very important here is that also, if you treat for 52 weeks in the sinus 52 trial, is that also there, we didn't reach the plateau phase. So probably a longer treatment would have even given a better effect. E equally interesting, you see that if you inject every 14 days and you compare that after 24 weeks, you switch to every month instead of every 14 days, then you see that the differences are not large there. So you might maybe taper down. Although my personal opinion is that it's 24 weeks is too early to taper down here. You had a very good effect on symptoms on SNOT22. I will not dig, dig into deep in all these things because I want to dig a little bit deeper into some mechanistic points. What are all the targets that we should be aware of and, and that are not per se anti ismophil targets? The first is, of course, oh, um, uh, omalizumab anti-IgE. And this is one of the trials I'm very proud of that, that I conducted. I did the one an academic trial a long time ago. And then this is the large uh, multi-center trial that was published recently. And here you see an anti-IgE treats indeed nasal polyps uh, over 52 weeks. When you stop the treatment, polyps slowly grow, grow back. And the same is true for SNOT22. So also targeting an anti-IgE has an effect in nasal polyps and keep that in mind for later on. This is a study that was not successful. Favipreprant, a prostaglandin D2 receptor antagonist, did not show any results. Uh, I, it was also published this year by me, a little bit of a disappointment, but not every trial we do can be positive. And I want to point to the study that Whitney already pointed at, is the Dexpramipexol trial uh, by Tanya Laidlow. And indeed, what is there interesting is that this drug depletes isonophil in tissue. However, there was no any effect on the total nasal polyp score, which is interesting. And this brings us back in, what is the role of the isonophil in the polyp tissue? Is it rather... IL-5 that is important or IgE that is important. So take the blackboard and, 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 and try to choose a target. After 24 years, we are still not totally out, I think. We are interested in local diagnostics. I showed you already some data in the first Reslizumab trial, and we put these kind of little sponges in the nose, and we did that in every one of our trials. So here you see one of the papers where we measured ECP, IL-5, MMP9 in um, omalizumab, mepolizumab, methylprednisolone, and doxycycline treated nasal polyp patients. So you can do that in all the trials. Um, but interestingly, I wanted to come, come back to dupilumab. Dupilumab is an anti al 413 receptor antagonist. And what you see here, if you look into the nasal secretions locally, you see something else what you see in, uh, in, in, in the peripheral blood. Anyone know, or maybe you don't know, but I will tell you, if you give dupilumab to a patient with nasal polyps and asthma, that isnophils in the beginning, they go up. And, and it's probably because the homing is, is stopped by uh, dupilumab. And, and some people are very scared about this effect that isnophils go up. But if you see here, if you treat, then eotaxin 3 and ECP in the nasal secretions go down. So, it's not because in the blood is going up that locally in the tissue, something else is happening, which I think to my opinion is interesting. So ECP and the nasal secretion go down. If we compare to nasal isnophil and, uh, and ECP and nasal secretion with other treatments, we see indeed that mepolizumab is doing the same, is also decreasing ECP and nasal secretions. Uh, methylprednisolone was a little bit of a disappointment. Doxycycline was quite strong in that, which is another drug that has some effect in nasal polyps. I will not come too deep in that. But indeed, omalizumab and anti-IG didn't much affect isnophils locally in to, or uh, ECP in the nasal secretions after treatment. Interestingly, if we look for uh, local polyclonal IgE, total IgE in nasal secretions with dupilumab treatment, you see that in nasal secretion that IgE goes down. And of course, here the opposite, uh, uh, you, you, you see that actually that mepolizumab also decreases a little bit uh, IgE in nasal secretion, 
And omalism map, it goes up, but that has another region, reason because we cannot measure free IgE in commercial kits. Um, I want to finalize my talk with this nice um, findings of, of Tim Dalmar from Ghent, who did his PhD on this. And when we looked after surgery with patients treated with benralizumab and mepalizumab because of their asthma, and you see indeed that isnophils in that tissue after treatment, so before and after treatment, you see, or, or compared to other patients, that it goes down. And, and you see that with benralizumab and mepalizumab, the isnophils go down, e 2 the CLCs, they go down, which is, I think, very nice. And also you see here a very nice picture. So post mepolizumab depletes isnophils, but benralizumab is better. But if you remember from my talk, ben benralizumab had a less good clinical effect, although in tissue isnophils are depleted in a better way. And this is still the thing that puzzles me every day. So taken together, if we compare biologicals in chronic sinusitis with nasal polyps, you see that dupilumab seems to be the strongest one. So if you want the target, if you ask me what is the target, I think you should both go for an anti-IgE and an anti-isnophil drug or an anti-IL-5, because dupilumab seems to work on isnophils and IgE. Omalizumab only works on IgE and has quite a good effect, but less potent than dupilumab. Mepolizumab has a similar potency as omalizumab, and Benrali, surprisingly, was less potent than mepolizumab. And this is indeed what is most important, the isnophil or IL-5 as a target. And that's what we don't know today. What is also surprising is that if you look for the asthma trials and if you look for the lung physicians, it looks like all these treatments, omalizumab, mepolizumab, resizumab, benralizumab, and dupilumab, equally perform for asthma, which is not the case for nasal polyps. We do know also from clinical experience that benralizumab in nasal polyp patients is less potent than the others. And we are quite often disappointed. And we always say, well, the upper and the lower airway, they exactly react in the same way. Well, for benralizumab, this is not the case today. So to wrap up my talk, what is the role of isnophils and interleukin-5 in uh, chronic sinusitis with nasal polyps? Well, I'm not totally out. The jury is still out. We have not a final answer there, but these human trials give us a surprising insight in if you block this, if you block that, what is the effect? And I think we have to continue. We don't have guinea pigs with or mice with nasal polyps. We have to do it on real humans, unfortunately. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philippe. That was spot on and um, really up to date. I also appreciate seeing some of the recent stuff, including unpublished data. Um, so let me start. I'll ask a, a question. See if see if you agree with with this. You made the point. I think also spot on that the algorithm in that New England Journal, recent beautiful New England Journal paper, didn't mentioned polyps at the top and then kind of forgot about them uh, in terms of how to, how to incorporate that in prescribing which biologic. And it, it reminds me that I have an old slide where uh, if you look at the pivotal studies with the anti-eosinophil biologics and you dig out what percent of the enrolled asthmatics during those pivotal trials had sinus disease and nasal polyps. It's almost invariably around a third of them. And I, I wonder if those patients drove the positive results to some degree. In other words, if, if you hadn't enrolled those folks, what about the two thirds who don't have it? And it? But it makes the point I think that you made that those are often anti-eosinophil responders for their asthma. Mm -hmm. It, it's true that, they, that if you look for all the studies with asthma, if you look for the subgroup of asthmatic patients with nasal polyp, that the better responders are always those that have nasal polyp. So you have an add-on effect also on quality of life. You have better improvement, which is, of course, not a surprise. We also are very surprised, although I'm sitting every week next to my lung physicians and they are very aware what nasal polyps is. If we looked in all the severe asthmatics treated with biological and with a PhD student of mine, we were surprised to see that we were actually not, um, actually 
uh, not an ENT uh, surgeon was looking into the nose in 50% of all the severe asthma patients, which is surprisingly because I'm sitting there every week. And, 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 and so they miss a lot of it. So I do. Th I immediately said to Guy Brussella, the next time you publish a new annual journal of medicine, you have to include chronic sinusitis with nasal polyps because in real life, we always have this feeling, we had it clinically, that benralizumab was not performing very well in the patient. So we had a big discussion, uh, what drug to take. And benralizumab was, was, was indeed a frustration for me and for the patient mainly. So they should certainly write the a United Airway guideline if you choose a biological. And that's what I think is very crucial for the clinicians present here. Yes, look in the nose in your asthmatics. A um, couple questions in the, in the Q&A box. First one comes from uh, Joanna. I'm sorry, I don't know the last name. What, what do you think led to 50% of patients not responding to MEPO? And is there a predictive marker Yes, this is, of course, was one of the first small pilot trials we did, and, and we did only two injections. And as I showed later on in, in the paper recently published by Han, is that indeed, if you treat for 52 weeks, if that, that you actually, between half a year treatment and one year treatment, you have actually double of the patient responding. So you might reach around 70% of responders. Why patients don't respond is very, very hard. We, and it's a little bit different than in asthma, and that's only for mepolizumab, dupilumab, and, and omalizumab. We don't have this very nice responder analysis where we see, oh, you take that amount of isnophils. In nasal polyp, that doesn't seem to matter. Only for benralizumab, it matters. But for the other three ones, we can't find any biomarker or reason. However, I do have a feeling and something we miss and is something in the Isnofil society we like a lot is of course the charcoalidin crystals. When we see these patients in clinic that don't respond very well, what we do as a surgeon, we take those patients under a, uh, under a biological, we do a surgery. And quite often I find that during my surgery, I have this thick, sticky mucin secretions with charcoalidin crystals. So to my opinion, if you have this charcoalidin crystals with, with, with mucin and it's too much of that, you first need the surgery as well to remove all these. You, you have to understand that this, sometimes this takes us three hours trying to get all these sticky things out. You cannot remove these things at this stage just with the biological. So I think that the, bio, that, that the non-responders quite often could be responders if you first take out the sticky mucin. And maybe Bart Lambrecht's uh, CLC dissolving antibody will fix that for you. Yes, that's what we are working on and, and work to show later on, yes. Yeah, very cool. All right, another question from, uh, this one's from Timothy Hanks. Uh, he comments that IL-4, 5, and 13 are, are obviously downstream effector mechanisms in this disease. What do you think are the upstream initiating mechanisms that lead to the, their production? And then a, a parallel question was really about ILC2s as a source of the IL-5. Yeah, well, th that, that's the question. How, how high can we go upstream without harming your immunity and harming the patient? And, and the, I think the more downstream you are, the safer the drug will be. And, and, and I think that's, of course, hypothetical what I say now. But I think it's true. Uh, I think uh, an anti-IG is really downstream. And, and, and if, we have, if we can target in a safe way, uh, more upstream, we might have better results. Although I'm not always that convinced. As I said, the non-responders maybe just need a good surgery removing the charcoalidin crystals. So again, we should be very careful when we say, if we go more upstream, that we will have a better result. I'm not too, com too much convinced of that. All right, I think for the sake of time, we will move on. Philippe, there are still a, a few additional questions in the Q&A, if you have time to answer those. I will offline, answer them, be... yes. Great, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. The next presenter is from Boston. Uh, Katie Buckheit, and she's going to talk to us about alpha receptor 
positive cells in AERD and CRS with nasal polyps. Katie, thanks for, for presenting and take it away. Great. Okay, excellent. Can you all see my slides? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm excited to talk a little bit about our work looking at IL-5 receptor positive cells in AERD specifically. And um, I'll present some um, information that's a little bit different than maybe the, the typical dogma that um, I think has existed for a long time about nasal polyps really being driven by tissue eosinophilia. Um, so just as an overview of what we'll talk about, um, I'm going to briefly review um, AERD for everybody today. Um, Dr. Stevens gave a great introduction already um, and talk very briefly about respiratory biologic therapies as Dr. Gaver gave an excellent introduction to that as well. Um, I'm going to discuss non-eosinophil IL-5 receptor positive um, cells from nasal polyp tissue from patients with AERD um, and then talk about our results looking at a mechanistic study of IL-5 inhibition in patients with AERD and how it may be impacting other cells and pathways um, beyond just depleting tissue eosinophilia. So just briefly, um, AERD, aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, also known as NSAID exacerbated respiratory disease and Samter's triad, um, triad asthma has a little bit of a branding problem, is a classic triad of asthma, um, chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps, which tend to be very severe and recurrent, and respiratory reactions to any medication that inhibits cyclooxygenase one. So patients will develop um, nasal congestion, upper airway symptoms, or asthma symptoms when they take aspirin or NSAIDs. And mechanistically, um, I think there's a lot going on and we'll you know, try to stay focused here given the limited time, but um, it is marked by really profound blood and tissue eosinophilia as well as IgE. Um, it is a disorder of dysregulated cystine leukotrienes. So there's excessive basal CIS-LT generation, um, which actually increases when patients are exposed to COX-1 inhibitors, and they also have airways hyper-responsiveness to CIS-LTs. Um, it's also a disease, um, Dr. Stevens talked a bit about mast cell activation. Um, there is elevated prostaglandin D2 at baseline and during aspirin reactions, as well as histamine tryptase and leukotrienes. Um, and inhibitors of mast cell activation do indeed modify um, the patient's reactions to aspirin, um, and can have some benefit in treating the baseline disease as well. Um, the reason, you know, one of the reasons I care so much about this is that patients with ARD have really severe nasal polyps. So we have a registry of about 2000 patients at our center um, who have ARD and when they come to us, 60% of them have already had two or more endoscopic sinus surgeries. So they have um, recurrence of disease, 10% have had five or more, and this is because they have surgery, they feel great for a very brief amount of time. And then about 50% of our patients have reported that their polyps in the past have regrown in less than six months of surgery. Um, only 15% of patients have no regrowth at two years. So this is a really um, sort of a lot of morbidity associated with this. Um, in terms of um, sort of wh who, who we blame for the inflammation here, um, there are a lot of players. This is a really complex, um, complex system and, you know, certainly potential external triggers that can lead to epithelial cell dysregulation, which we know is markedly uh, dysregulated in uh, nasal polyposis, um, can lead to the production of innate type 2 cytokines and also, you know, it's adap um, adaptive type 2, type 2 cytokines are important as well. Um, and, you know, a variety of potential infector cells are involved here as well. Um, we've talked extensively about eosinophils, but also TH2 cells. Um, mast cells, um, B cells, basophils are all likely involved. Um, I'm going to focus going forward really, you know, on eosinophils and anti-IL-5 treatment, which, um, you know, as an allergist immunologist, I think from the beginning, you know, we've been taught that these anti-IL-5 drugs are really anti-eosinophil, but I'm going to present a little bit of um, data suggesting that they, they likely do more than that. So, We've seen this now for the third time because it's provocative, I think. Um, the efficacy of anti eosinophil drugs for CRS with nasal polyps. So, um, Dr. Stevens and Dr. Giver both talked about um, dexpramipexol, so a small molecule that really profoundly depletes eosinophils in um, 
this very small open label study, which really only included 13 patients. But um, I think that, you know, we certainly learned a lot from it from a negative study, which was um, led by my um, colleague and research mentor, uh, Tanya Laidlaw. And, you know, after just six months, we've seen this already, marked drop in blood eosinophils, as well as uh, tissue eosinophils. So, you know, pre and post treatment biopsies show uh, markedly fewer eos, but really no significant improvement in the nasal polyp size and the patients didn't actually feel that much better. So we were a site for this study and were involved with it. And around the same time, we'd also, um, colleagues of mine, uh, Dan Dwyer and uh, Jose ardavas Montañas, were um, using SQL, which is an early single cell RNA sequencing platform to sequence nasal polyp cells. And um, we were really interested to see that um, there were a variety of different cells in the nasal polyp tissue that expressed IL-5 receptor alpha beyond just the eosinophils. So here, um, these light peach cells were antibody secreting cells, plasma cells, and there's tons of IL-5 receptor expressed on those cells. Um, we see that the ciliated epithelial cells have lots of IL-5 receptor on them. Um, and also the mast cells, which are down here in red, have quite a bit of IL-5 receptor as well. So um, notably, eosinophils are really absent from, um, from this analysis, and that's because two reasons. One, the endogenous RNAs make it difficult to do single cell RNA sequencing on them, but two, um, the samples were really manually triturated. So I think um, that disrupted the eosinophils as well. So we don't actually see eosinophils, but still tons of IL-5 receptor on, on the other cell types that we did single cell RNA sequencing on them. So, um, you know, we all think, I think of IL-5 as being really anti-eosinophil, but, you know, it was originally defined as a T-cell um, derived cytokine that triggered activated B cells for terminal differentiating to, differentiation into uh, antibody secreting plasma cells. So we reclustered the nasal polyp um, antibody secreting cells. And we see that in the patients with ARD, which are represented by all the little blue dots, these are their plasma cells. Um, those cells are really enriched for IL-5 receptor. Um, looking at the violin plots of, again, just the RNA sequencing, we see that there is much more IL-5 receptor in the plasma, on the plasma cells from patients with ARD. So, you know, we see this at the RNA level. And then also, um, this is via flow cytometry, we see that the plasma cells from subjects with AERD have much more IL-5 receptor alpha on them than do um, the aspirin tolerant patients with CRS and nasal polyp. So, you know, this um, led us, I think, to be very interested in, you know, what an anti-IL-5 drug is doing besides just depleting eosinophils, especially in light of the dexprimapexol findings. So looking more uh, in more detail about this IL-5 receptor alpha uh, population and the antibody, secre antibody secreting cells in general, is that you know, we do see that there's a proliferating population of um, plasma cells from the subjects with AERD, um, here marked by KI-67. And that, again, that population, you know, there's, there's IL-5 kind of throughout, but that population is, is certainly enriched for IL-5. And then we see actually a robust correlation between um, CCND2, which is encodes for cyclin D2, which is a, a regulator of um, cell cycle transition, we see that there's actually a quite robust correlation between CCND2 and IL-5 receptor in the single cell RNA sequencing. So it means that the same cells are expressing um, both transcripts. And um, you know, 0.28 is actually a very, very robust correlation for um, single cell RNA sequencing. So, you know, we wonder if these if IL-5 could potentially be having some sort of um, role in driving plasma cell proliferation in the nasal polyp tissue of patients with AERD. Um, we did an ex vivo stimulation of purified nasal polyp plasma cells from subjects with AERD, where we stimulated them for just six hours with, I think, one nanogram per ml of interleukin-5. And we see actually upregulation um, of several in the simulated cells, upregulation of um, a variety of transcripts that are involved in um, cellular prol proliferation and cell cycling, including CCND2, that gets significantly upregulated um, with stimulation with IL-5. And this is um, this is unpublished, but um, is just actually bulk RNA sequencing of uh, nasal polyp plasma cells from patients with AERD compared to CRS with nasal polyps. And we see that um, the sort of very markedly differentially expressed transcripts that are specific to AERD, um, we see the IL-5 receptor is is upregulated in the ARD patients, as well as CCND2, 
And then um, IgE heavy chain transcript as well. I didn't, I, I mentioned before that IgE is very elevated in the tissue of um, nasal polyps in general, and also really from patients with AERD. And, you know, there is um, co-expression of IgE heavy chain transcript and IL-5 receptor alpha um, in the nasal polyplasma cells from AERD. So again, you know, we had the question of could, could IL-5 be driving um, pathologic production of IgE at the local polyp level in our patients with AERD? So to try to understand a little bit more about um, what is happening um, when we inhibit IL-5, we designed a case control study of subjects with AERD who um, were treated with mepolizumab. So 18, we had 18 patients with ARD um, who were treated with mepolizumab and compared them to 18 patients with ARD who had um, who were matched for disease severity, who were not on any biologic, and analyzed a variety of different specimens from the patients um, and found that IL-5 inhibition with um, mepolizumab led to several measured differences. Um, really interestingly and unexpectedly, we saw differences in inferior turbinate epithelium, and um, there's upreg upregulation of tight jun junction transcripts and cilium organizations. So I'll show you that data um, in a minute. We saw expectedly changes in eosinophils and basophils, um, and then also some possible um, changes that could have been related to uh, anti-IL-5 effect on mast cells, although certainly some of these changes could also um, just be due to depletion of eosinophils, but um, decrease in uh, urinary prostaglandins, leukotrienes, um, as well as nasal um, mucosinoids as well. So to look more closely, um, unsurprisingly, we see that um, eosinophils um, in the peripheral blood are much lower in the patients who are treated with mepolizumab compared to the patients with ARD who are not on mepolizumab. We also see um, lower basophil levels as well. Um, and looking at the mucosinoids, both at the nasal and systemic level, we see this decrease in um, PGD2, LTE4, and PGF2 alpha seen here, um, which you know may well underlie some of the mechanism of benefit that's afforded by mepolizumab for our patients with ARD. As I told you, um, you know, acosinoids are known to be markedly dysregulated in this population of patients. Um, and as Dr. Gavere mentioned, um, and I think he, he showed although I uh, didn't call it out in the benralizumab study, that patients with ARD were, were responders to the anti-IL-5 and also um, same thing was seen in the mepolizumab um, phase three studies. Um, but you know, we know that um, elevated levels of PGD2 in ARD can both can lead to nasal edema um, mediated through the DP1 receptor, as well as activation and recruitment of eosinophils, basophils, ILC2s mediated through CRTH2. Um, I talked about how LTE4 has an important role in AERD. And then PGF2-alpha um, here, which has been less thoroughly studied in AERD, um, is like PGD2, a CRTH2 um, agonist. And then looking at, this is um, bulk RNA sequencing from inferior terminate curatage um, of the patients on um, mepolizumab compared to those not on mepolizumab, we see that there is in induction of epithelial tight junction related transcripts as well as psyllium organization. So um, I think what would be very interesting is to actually biopsy the nasal polyp tissue, um, bi biopsy the nasal polyp tissue itself and look for differences here. Um, the turbinate is not necessarily the most perfect place to look, although it was accessible to us for our patients and practical to do. Um, I think that this is a fascinating finding and something that we are following up on and, and find very interesting. So in addition, um, one kind of, I think, novel and unexpected finding that we had was that um, CRTH2 was increased on the remaining eosinophils and basophils in um, the patients who were treated with mepolizumab compared to patients who were not on mepolizumab. So, you know, uh, and we see that it is inversely correlated to the nasal and urinary PGD2 and um, PGF2 alpha. And a potential likely explanation for this finding um, is that CRTH2 stimulation by PGD2 or PGF2 alpha leads to receptor internalization 
and potentially reduce surface expression of CRTH2. And when we remove the acosinoid stimuli, um, a potential increase in CRTH2 expression um, could be ex expected. Um, you know, we don't we don't have data to prove this, but nasal polyp tissue mast cells also express CRTH2, um, and CRTH2 signaling on mast cells may lead to uh, intracellular calcium mobilization and cellular migration. So, decreased levels of PGD2 in our patients on mepolizumab could also lead to less mast cell activation accumulation. Um, although, you know, without really biopsying the tissue, we can't we can't see that, and we haven't done a biopsy study um, on and off mepolizumab in our patients with AERD. Um, back to plasma cells, because that's kind of where I started, um, to try to get a sense of whether or not inhibition with IL-5 impacted nasal polyp plasma cells, we looked at nasal mucus immunoglobulin levels in patients on mepolizumab compared to controls, um, and specifically IgE we were very interested in, because remember I told you that the IL-5 receptor alpha population of nasal polyp plasma cells expressed high levels of um, nasal uh, high levels of IgE heavy chain transcript. Um, and really we don't see any difference in serum or nasal levels of IgE or here is shown IgG4. Um, so I don't think that means that um, IL-5, an anti-IL-5 doesn't have action on um, nasal polyplasma cells or antibody secreting cells. Um, I think that there is a lot more we can look at in terms of um, how it could potentially impact activation or proliferation of nasal polyp plasma cells. Um, and those studies are underway, as well as studies um, really further exploring the function um, and role of IL-5 in, um, in its actions on sinus tissue plasma cells and B cells. So in terms of our major findings, um, like I said, IL-5 is present on a variety of different nasal polyp plasma um, cell types, including plasma cells, Ciliated epithelial cells, mast cells, um, in patients really specifically with AERD, but also we see this in CRS with nasal polyp as well, not to the same high extent. Um, single cell RNA sequencing identified a novel population of plasma cells in patients with AERD, which was marked by expression of IgE heavy chain transcript, um, KI67, IL-5 receptor alpha. And treatment with mepolizumab had impacts, I think, you know, beyond just what we expected with eosinophils, but also, you know, certainly impacts on um, basal cells and epithelial cells and really possibly mast cells, although I think additional studies are, are needed to prove that further. Um, and, you know, we have many questions remaining and things that we're, we're studying going forward, but, you know, we're, we're very curious about whether or not there's a, a pathogenic role um, in terms of these IL-5 receptor positive plasma cells in AERD. And is IL-5, you know, really driving um, plasma cell or uh, antibody secreting cell mediated inflammation in these patients? And do drugs targeting IL-5 or IL-5 receptor alpha have impacts really you know, beyond uh, depletion of tissue eosinophils, but also on plasma cells, epithelial cells, and mast cells? Um, so um, thank you to my research group. And um, that is it. So I can take questions. Thank you so much. Another great, great talk. Uh, the Q&A box is open for questions. So please. Please enter your questions there. Uh, while we're waiting, I'll be three for three for three, and I'll start with the first question. Given the differences in mechanisms of action between benralizumab and, and mepo, I, I know benra also blocks IL-5 binding to the receptor, but its claim to fame is its ability to deplete IL-5 receptor bearing cells. So my question is. If there, are all, if there are these IL-5 receptor positive cells in the nose besides eosinophils, are there NK cells or other IgG receptor bearing cells in nasal tissues at sufficient levels that you might or might not get ADCC activity with a drug like Benra? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are certainly NK cells. I don't know if they're at levels that would be sufficient. I mean, I, I suspect they would. Um, what I what I don't know about benralizumab, especially the doses that have been studied for for treatment with nasal polyps, if if there's sufficient really tissue penetration to adequately deplete all of the IL five receptor positive cells, um, I think you know there is certainly a known depletion in tissue eosinophilia with benralizumab, but um, whether or not it's depleting the other anti IL or the IL five receptor positive cells adequately um, is not known. 
um, that that has not yet, to my knowledge, been really published or, or studied. Well, I, I think it's it's under study, but not not uh, no no really adequate results available yet to answer that question. Maybe you could do an explant system and add add Benra to the explant and see. If yes, it that, yes, that is yeah, that is something that um, that is something that we are looking to do for sure. Cool. Uh, we have a couple of questions. And then and I also, Philippe, go ahead and then I'll do yeah, the box. Well, well, I did my PhD thesis on alpha receptor regulation. And, and what is, of course, known by today, by back then, not yet, is that if you look for alpha receptor expression into bone marrow, into uh, peripheral blood, and into tissue, is that there is a big difference in how that works. In, in bone marrow, your soluble alpha receptor is very low and the transmembrane is very high. So it makes your cells, stem cells, very sensitive for the L5 signal. If you look then into, in, into, secre in, into um, systemic circulation, it is in between. So you have some soluble, some transmembrane, but if you look into tissues, you see that the transmembrane is really downregulated and the soluble is really upregulated. So you have masses of soluble L5 receptor alpha, which is an antagonist on its own in tissue. So if you add benralizumab, I do ask, is the concentration high enough to tackle the natural antagonism by soluble IL-5 receptor? And that's something I think we do not know yet. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think even sputum eosinophils have downregulated IL-5 receptors on their surface as well. That's a common theme, I think. Um, Karen Affleck put a question in the in the box, um, how much do you believe there is a direct effect of IL-5 on mast cell activation? And, and maybe I'll add, and, and via what mechanism? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So, so mast cells do have, um, have an IL-5 receptor. Um, and you know, the, there's actually some very old data by um, one of my research mentors, Josh Boyce, showing um, some impact of actually, I think, anti-IL-5 on mast cell activation. Um, in vitro from many, many, like the 1990s. Um, for our study that we've done with, with mapolizumab, I, I don't know that we can say that for certain that it actually is impacting mast cells or not. I think that the, the findings that we saw with the prostaglandins could you know, certainly be solely or mainly related to depletion of um, eosinophils and you know a little bit basal fills, which we know which we know happened. So I don't I don't know that that study really adequately answered that question. I think um, doing you know potentially an explant system um, and or you know biopsy studies pre at least you know looking for you know if there's any difference in you know tissue mass cells or um, you know other other findings related to mast cell activation in the tissue level, that would be interesting. We did not see any changes in tryptase, um, serum tryptase or nasal tryptase pre or post treatment with mepolizumab. So, um, you know, I think that tells us that um, the mast cell burden is potentially unchanged. I think there are also some older data that eosinophil granule proteins can directly activate mast cells from Larry Thomas and Jerry Gleick and, um, I'll also point out, just to add to what you mentioned, that in studies in hyperosinophilic syndrome that Fei-Lai Kuang and, and Amy Cleon and others have done, benralizumab does not appear to deplete mast cells. So they, either there's not enough receptor on the mast cells to be a target, or they're in, in regions where there aren't NK cells or other, other cells around to do the depleting activity. Another interesting, interesting observation. Um, we got a bunch more questions um, from uh, Hyun Chun. Is it possible to compare quantitatively or qualitatively the number of IL-5 receptor positive cells in polyps before and after MEPO? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and something that we, we wish we'd done. It has become more challenging to do that now because we are rarely using mepolizumab actually to treat patients with AERD. Um, they respond almost universally to dupilumab. So that has really become our first line biologic therapy for those patients. So, um, you know, we would love to actually be able to look, you know, pre and post mepolizumab and benralizumab and that, but we're prescribing it much less. Um, and so, you know, whereas many of these studies are really observational in patients, you know, undergoing their usual standard of care, we just have not been able to get um, 
an adequate number of patients who've been treated with mepolizumab in the last couple of years. Next question um, comes from P. Dixie. Uh, have the biologic studies in, in CRS been done in patients on high dose topical steroids? Is there any data on increased steroid sensitivity after biologic treatment? That's a, that, that's a that, good, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I think that's a, that's a hard point because um, corticoid sensitivity is something which is better defined for asthma than for nasal polyps. And in nasal polyps, well, what is it? All polyps respond for systemic steroids. And so, so, so that's not something you can do. Local, yeah, we do know that the local corticoids don't get where they should go. So what is the definition of um, corticoid sensitive polyps? I think that that's, that's the first problem. And that's the reason why we can't answer the question. Yeah, these drugs are steroid sparing in a sense, probably, but oh yes, yes, you'd have and, to look and that's at... what we that that have been shown that of course right. that all the trials uh, with MIPO, with 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 Dupi, with um, uh, Benra, and 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 with um, uh, Omalizumab, they are steroid sparing. That's that's the case. Yes. Um, there's a question for actually for any of the speakers. What? I'll just boil things down in this question because of time. What what do we think is driving the IgE in upper in these upper airways diseases? <laughs> That's one of my favorite things. I, I, I think next to isnophils, I also lo love IgE, and I think this polyclonal IgE, which is there, is still a surprising finding. And and um, I think many things can drive. Um, the plasma cells, so, so to make polyclonal IgE. And, and, and I think we pointed out to super antigens, but I think also fungal disease can do that. Uh, and I think charcolidin crystals in a way are also involved in, 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 in this driving the system nuts. Um, but to my opinion, uh, I am a stronger believer that targeting isnophils, but also targeting IgE is the way to go in fully controlling nasal polyp disease. And I think that's the reason why DUPI is so strong because it's, as I shown in my talk, it works on both pathways a little bit. So there's time for one more, more comment. Um, Param just simply wanted to make the point that IL-5 receptor alpha expression in sinus tissue alone may not be sufficient to ex explain its, its reduced efficacy on polyps because Benra can deplete eosinophils in the GI tissue and the skin, uh, unless sinus tissue milieu is, is unique. Like you said, maybe the antibody just doesn't, doesn't get there as a possibility. Um, Philippe, final, final comment, and then we'll have to bring- I, I think that, that, that both with dexpramipexola and with benralizumab, uh, for, for, for of course benralizumab, they have treated one year, which is long. But I'm still a believer that if you treat longer and also with dexpromipexole, there is an effect in asthma with dexpromipexole. So I've seen that at the quadruple AI, there was a poster on dexpromipexole and an effect on asthma. So maybe if you treat very long with dex, dexpromipexole, you might have an effect. I'm not certain. Kathleen, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so I don't know the answer to that, but, but I wonder, like, if the point where those patients were captured, which was when their pulps were very severe and they were only treated with six months, you know, if, if potentially it was done at a different point, like, you know, right after surgery when they had no pulps, would it prevent that like fibrin de deposition and other stuff that, that Dr. Stevens talked about um, where, you know, maybe it would prevent pulps from regrowing. Um, the other comment that I, I wanted to make about the, the mast cells is, you know, our group was wondering if in part, part of the reason why there were, you know, higher numbers measured is just they're easier to see after all of those eosinophils are depleted, if they, you know, were easier to count, um, cause they can be hard to see in a sea of eosinophils. Um, so anyway, but, but I don't, you know, I don't know, you know, if longer treatment would make a difference, but potentially, or just treatment at a different time point. I think for the sake of time, we're going to have to bring this to a close. Thank you for this, um, these wonderful presentations, lively discussions. Um, Florence, do you want to say a final word as we, um, as we sign off? Yes, I do. I have a couple of slides um, and a couple of announcements. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, everyone, uh, for very, very nice, uh, very complimentary and thought-provoking presentations. Um, once again, we had a very, very successful and interesting webinar. So thank you all. And, and thank you to uh, Bruce, the moderator, who uh, did the job 
remarkably, remarkably well. Next slide. I would like to just announce our future webinar, which is going to be special. It's a bit different from what we've been doing so far. This is a webinar which is really focused on our trainee members because we have uh, quite a few uh, members that have joined us during the past year and a half. So this is going to be an inaugural IES training workshop dedicated to ease in the field biology. It's going to be held as usual on the last Wednesday of the month at the same time. Um, more information will be available on the site shortly regarding the practical aspects on how this uh, workshop is going to happen. But we have three very, very fine mentors um, who are going to uh, be associated and animate this session uh, for our trainees. The other announcement that I would like to make, and that's on the next slide, is uh, the in-person meeting of the Eosinophil Mast Cell and Basophil Research Network, which is going to be held in July this year. Uh, it's going to be held in Utrecht in the Netherlands from July 11th to 13th. And you already know, I think, that we decided with the Mass Health Society to plan um, different forms of uh, interactions between both societies. And I think that today's presentations really underlined how meaningful, how much that makes sense uh, working together. And so in addition to our joint webinar that was held uh, a while ago, we uh, have been invited to uh, organize a joint session with the International Eosinophil Society within the program of that mast cell and basophil meeting. That joint session will be held on Wednesday, July 13th. You can find more information on the program uh, on the website, which is shown in the bottom of the slide. But um, I would also like to underline that during this joint session, there will be three invited speakers from our society who will be uh, presenting their work to mast cell and basophil specialists. But there's also uh, 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 an oral abstract presentation session. And so for the moment, I think that the abstract submission deadline is April 30th, but as I understand, that deadline is going to be extended. So if there are any members of our society who would be interested in um, sending or submitting an abstract for that joint session, uh, I think that you still have uh, a couple of weeks to do so. So don't hesitate to go check out the program. Next slide. Finally, if you want to uh, hear more about our programs, sessions, and events that we will be organizing, including uh, our next in-person meeting, which is planned to uh, happen in July next year, so 2023, at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to our society using the email address, which is shown on this slide, or you can also uh, check out our website. You saw the address a, a bit earlier on today. Thanks to everyone for attending and uh, thank you everyone for the good organization of today's webinar. Have a nice day. <laughs>